literature to break and remake our notions of form and language. Lorna Sage calls Lessing an expert in unsettlement and not without reason. To think of Doris Lessing in relation to South Asia is to invite a comparative frame of reference, not merely to mark out similarities and differences between her literary world and ours, but to seek out broader insights into the role that literature can play in addressing social inequities and crossing the boundaries that divide people from people. In this lecture, with reference to the theme of the conference, I will focus on what voices from the margin can imply for Doris Lessing and her readers, especially with respect to readers in South Asia. The term marginality was first introduced in sociology by Robert Parks in 1928 with respect to the experiences of immigrants, but has now expanded to encompass cultural marginality, which is associated with transcultural identities, social marginality, which involves the restraints preventing an individual from belonging to a privileged group, and structural marginality, which has to do with political, social, and economic disadvantage. Contemporary discourse, according to Berndt and Collini, defines marginality, and I quote, as lack of power, participation, and integration experienced by a group or a territory, unquote. The concept of marginality is often associated and sometimes identified with the related terms exclusion and peripheralization. Exclusion can be both process and condition, resulting from a combination of intertwined forms of social, economic, and power inequalities, and leading to disadvantage, relegation, and the systematic denial of individual rights, opportunities, and resources. Peripheralization is a term that deals with inter- and intra-regional issues. All three concepts, which often overlap or are regarded as interchangeable, adopt a relational approach to inequalities and imbalances of power and draw upon the implied paradigm of the relations between a center and one or more peripheries. My own analysis in this lecture highlights the ways in which Lessing problematizes the assumption that marginality applies to fixed categories, exploring instead the ways in which different forms of marginality can intersect and how margins and centers can shift and mutate according to changing contexts and discourses. I also consider some of the ways in which Lessing's writings on marginality resonate in South Asian contexts and some productive ways for us to engage with her legacy. To read Lessing within South Asian frames of reference is a demanding task. And here I'll outline some of the demands that it places upon us. It requires us to reflect on the idea of South Asia itself. It demands an awareness of the complexities involved in speaking of South Asia, a region marked by a close interconnectedness as well as great diversity, a geopolitical configuration with its own internal tensions and heterogeneous forms of marginality that are rooted in, the, in our own historical, geographical, and cultural particularities. The theoretical definitions of marginality that we have just discussed do not necessarily take into account our own local structures of power, certain context-specific forms of discrimination based on caste, community, language, and religion, or the social and psychological effects of cultural and historical milestones, such as the Bhakti movement, partition, or the Dalit movement, to take just a few examples. Reading Lessing from South Asian perspectives, therefore, unsettles even the conventional Western categorizations of forms of marginality. It demands that we simultaneously also read ourselves, looking deep into our own histories and social formations in South Asia. In addition, it demands an aesthetic awareness 
because literary discourse, even politically driven interventionist literature, operates differently from social documentation and political commentary because it involves the process of creative representation. It also demands a transcultural awareness that crosses territorial boundaries to make us think beyond the contours of the nation. Doris Lessing's own experiences of cultural difference and her concerns with issues of marginality lie at the core of her thought and writing. Hers was a life of multiple migrancies, as we all know, from her birth in Persia, modern Iran, to the early years in southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and sub subsequent move to England, and her journeys back to Africa to find her entry formally prohibited there, and so on. In every location, she felt she was something of an exile, a partial outsider who did not quite belong. This in-between position gave her a special vantage point from which to critique dominant attitudes and systems of power. As she says about her experience of moving to London, and I quote, I have this double vision, absolutely belonging and absolutely not belonging which is extremely valuable for a writer." Unquote. But this marginal outsider status also generated complex, shifting, layered perspectives on contemporary issues. For as I have argued elsewhere, even when Lessing attacks certain mainstream attitudes and systems, she also often remains associated with the very structure she sets out to interrogate. For instance, she critiques patriarchy, but has been accused of adopting conservative positions on certain feminist debates. She de deconstructs modern psychiatry, but draws on the psychoanalytical paradigms of Jung and uses the form of the confessional diary in her fiction. She writes of poverty, yet cannot quite come out of her own middle class moorings. Hence, Lessing's writing acquires ambivalent hues which defy attempts to pigeonhole her with easy labels and black and white definitions. These tensions complicate but also enrich her writings for they draw the reader into the challenge of interpreting the tangled, often contradictory impulses underlying her texts. Lessing's Representations of marginality often appear dystopian, but behind them lies a utopian impulse to imagine into being a better place. Living in a fragmented world, she dreams of a fuller realization of human potential within an expanding consciousness of the universe at large. In the Golden Notebook, Anna Wolf says, and I quote, humanism stands for the whole person the whole individual striving to become as conscious and responsible as possible about everything in the universe." Unquote. The words of the fictional character seem to echo Lessing's own vision. In this vision, which evolves through her long writing life, the sense of human responsibility, especially the responsibility of a writer, remains a constant preoccupation. In the small personal voice, she says, and I quote, we are all of us directly or indirectly caught up in a great whirlwind of change. It is the beginning of something else, which I think is the minimum act of humility for a writer. To know that one is a writer at all because one represents, makes articulate, is continuously and invisibly fed by numbers of people who are inarticulate, to whom one belongs, to whom one is responsible. This responsibility involves engaging with our others in ways that challenge imbalances and hierarchies of power at different social levels. But her writings also present the other as a construct we create in order to negate elements that are actually part of our own hidden selves, our inner psyche. The fifth child, for instance, dramatizes a mother's struggle to accept a child she regards as alien, though he is from her own womb. As Julia Kristeva says, and I quote, strangely, 
The foreigner lives within us. He is the hidden face of our identity, the space that wrecks our abode, the time in which understanding and affinity found us. By recognizing him within ourselves, we are spared detesting him in himself." Unquote. This is perhaps the impulse behind Lessing's representations of othering in her fiction, suggesting that change must begin from within. Here's what... Uh, excuse me, is the, are these messages for me? Uh, no, no, no. Rakhati, I think they are for the technical team. Okay, thank you. Um, the forms of otherness and marginality addressed in Lessing's writings are many. Here I will speak of a few, but while we may tend to segregate each category for convenience of analysis, different forms of marginality actually intertwine in Lessing's narratives. Hence, it is productive to read her work through the lens of intersectionality. The marginalization of women by patriarchal societies remains a continuing and pressing concern in Lessing's writing, despite her disavowals about the women's movement. She remains engaged with issues concerning women's subjectivity, sexuality, and social exploitation, asserting, and I quote, women often get dropped from memory and then history, unquote. South Asian critics take note of this dimension in her writing. According to Ratna Raman, for instance, and I quote, Lessing's fictional writing focuses on women and their intersection around the questions of race, gender, and positionality, locating them within a long tradition of women's histories, unquote. In my own book, Feminism and Contemporary Women Writers, I examine Lessing's treatment of women's subjectivity, focusing specially on the tropes of motherhood and the body, and placing Lessing in a comparative frame alongside several other women writers from different cultural locations. On a related axis, Lessing uses her fiction to address questions of gender and sexuality. Traditional notions of femininity and masculinity come in for sharp scrutiny in her texts. In The Grass is Singing, we see a bold representation of Mary's difficulty in accepting heterosexuality. The Golden Notebook, as Ratna Raman reminds us, draws attention to the existence of alternate sexualities, stressing the off-centering of experience and the impossibility of a single point of focus. Love, again, presents ageism and heteronormativity as forms of social prejudice that intersect to create the particular predicament of its 65-year-old female protagonist who falls in love with two men much younger than herself. These texts, and I'm quoting Syme, encompass interest, behaviors, functioning, satisfaction, intimate relationships, and sexual self-esteem, questioning heteronormative behavior and heterosexist and ageist assumptions." Unquote. Issues of race preoccupy Lessing from her very first novel, The Grass is Singing. Drawing on her own experiences, she portrays tensions between black and white communities in an African setting. Racism is here framed in the context of colonial history. Lessing's critique of imperialism is hard hitting, but also complicated by her own position as a white woman of British origin. For South Asian readers, such texts open up a space for comparative study to consider the intersection of racism and colonialism in our own history as represented in literary discourse. It is also possible, as the scholars point out, to draw parallels between racism and imperialist discourse and caste discrimination in India. The interface between race and caste as axes of marginalization remains a contested question, offering the possibility of significant comparative scholarship. Lessing's use of voices from the margins in her fiction 
raises issues of representation that recall Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak's famous question, can the subaltern speak? For as Spivak points out, representation can imply portrayal or description, but it can also mean standing for or speaking for a particular group as their proxy in a political sense. Do Lessing's characters from the margins of society offer us a picture of society through the depiction of their perspectives and their plight? Or does her representation of them amount to an appropriation of voice and hence a kind of further silencing? Such questions acquire added pertinence when we think of similar debates in Dalit discourse about whether or not a non-Dalit can or should represent the Dalit experience. The contemporary South Asian reader of Lessing needs to engage with these debates. Class hierarchies form a primary preoccupation in Lessing's work. But her ideas evolve in complex ways. For despite her eventual rejection of communism, she continues to empathize with the economically deprived sections of society and to criticize the crass materialism of modern society. Her habit of dialectical thought is also the legacy of her familiarity with Marxist thought. To those who say she has turned right wing, she retorts, and I quote, I've got someone who calls me right-wing because I describe the Soviet Union as one of the worst tyrannies the world has ever seen, which it is. If this is right-wing, then I think the use of language has become so sloppy. It's not language anymore. It's just slogans again, unquote. This is a, a lesson at her crustiest best. Lessing's suspicion of slogans comes from her innate ability to see shades of gray and to respond to actual situations rather than abstract ideological positions. Lessing's engagements with marginality and her transcultural sensibility extend to forms of faith. She goes against mainstream religious traditions in her involvement with Sufism, deeply influenced by the ideas of Idris Shah, who says, and I quote, be in the world, but not of it." Unquote. Alka Kumar, and I'm deliberately citing various South Asian scholars here who have been working on Lessing. Alka Kumar traces Lessing's literary journey in relation to feminism, psychoanalysis, and Sufism. She says, and I quote, the intermeshings of realism and symbolism, failure of political solutions leading to possibilities of transcendent coherence resting in the unconscious, and the expansion of inner space with its corresponding potential for spiritual growth were some strategies that dominated her work. Umar explains, and I quote, the Sufi contends that the world should be viewed with a holistic perspective, wherein the abstract and the intuitive have as much validity as the logical and the linear, unquote. In a prophetic tone, Lessing also speaks of an endangered planet because of the human exploitation of nature. She says, we've got to think long term. If we don't, I really do think our civilization will collapse. We are threatened by so many different things, from the ozone layer to the filth in the North Sea and our poisoned rivers. She refers to the importance of, and I quote, a new kind of awareness the need for a global responsibility. This is a new thing in the world and will save us, she says. Lessing's words, uttered in 1992, resonate with even greater urgency in our present context as we battle climate change and the environmental crisis. Lessing consciously tries to cultivate the stance of a detached observer. But from the above discussion, it becomes clear that she actually remains passionately involved in the struggle for consciousness raising in an embattled world. In spite of her strong political awareness and her direct involvement in social realities, Lessing's fiction does not belong in the domain of sociology, political science, or anthropology, but to the domain of literature, which deals not with documentation, but with aesthetic representation. Her writings go beyond the realist mode to challenge mainstream norms of fiction writing through radical experiments with form to find suitable expression for her
difficult subject matter. The Golden Notebook, according to Lessing, makes its central statement through its form. Here, Lessing challenges mainstream literary norms by using a fragmented mode of narration in which different kinds of writing are patched together in a deliberately discordant way. He finds letters, headlines from newspapers, journal entries, even bits of pastiche and parody, along with screenplay from cinema, to push the boundaries of what constitutes the literary. Her experiments with inner space fiction and science fiction also show her capacity to invent new forms of narrative to deal with unfamiliar subjects. In the futuristic narratives of the four gated city and Mara and Dan, for instance, Lessing adopts non-realistic modes to explore the interface between human and non-human worlds. The text critiques the dominant narrative that justifies the exploration, the exploitation of nature in the name of human progress in the context of global power politics. In such texts, the non-human world seems to speak back to its human exploiters like another voice from the margins. It must be emphasized, though, that while discussions on marginality tend to focus primarily on differences, Lessing also simultaneously reminds us of the need to extend the discourse to questions of commonality and interdependence. She values connectedness as much as she prizes autonomy, recognizing the paradox that freedom comes from encumbrance and responsibility. In an interview with Michael Dean, she says, and I quote, I had spent a lot of my time breaking things down into categories and classifying things and making either ors or black and whites of everything. I had come to realize that it was psychologically, psychically an extremely dangerous thing to do. I have been trying ever since then to try not to do this and to try to see in fact what we have in common, which is much more important." Unquote. Such a vision does not erase difference to impose a forced homogeneity, but re recognizes overlaps and linkages across heterogeneous realities. According to Catherine Fishburne, and I quote, rather than supporting the Western ethos of individualism and pragmatism, Lessing proffers an alternative ethos based on cooperation and transcendence, unquote. Such was also the imagination of Rabindranath Tagore, and here I will speak briefly in a comparative vein. Rabindranath Tagore, in the early 20th century, had coined the term Vishwa Sahitya when asked to speak about comparative literature. Unlike the term literature, which draws on the notion of literacy and access to the written word, Sahitya derives from the Sanskrit term Sahit, meaning with or together suggesting the idea of collaboration or connectivity. The similarity with Lessing's idea of transcending difference through cooperation becomes apparent. Tagore argues for a world literature that is not just the sum or aggregate of all national literatures, but an expression of a shared spirit of creativity across borders. He says, just as this world is not my plough land added to yours, added to someone else's. So also literature is not my writing added to yours and someone else's. He adds, the thing truly worth seeing in world literature is the way human beings express their joy in literature and the abiding form in which the human soul wishes to reveal itself through the diversity of this expression, unquote. Tagore's vision and Lessing's later articulation of the need to look for common grounds across different human experiences share a similar understanding of the role that literature can play in connecting a divided world. Reading Lessing in the light of Tagore's statements can be inspirational, offering up possibilities for us to imagine a contemporary South Asian model of world literature. In fact, it's a pleasure to see that there's going to be a paper on Tagore and Lessing in this webinar. In this South Asian model that I'm imagining here, translation can play a major role. For ours is a multilingual culture, 
and the transmission of texts across languages, cultures, and regional and national boundaries is an important way of promoting connectivity and transcultural linkages. Translations across South Asian languages are the need of the hour because at present English as the global language dominates and most translations here happen into or from English. So translations across South Asian languages are the need of the hour, but also translations to and from international languages so as to avoid insularity. As Ajmal Kamal, the Pakistani editor of the journal called The City asserts, collaborative translation where translators with different linguistic specializations work together across language boundaries can be of particular relevance to South Asian contexts. Translating Lessing into different South Asian languages, for instance, can go a long way towards generating greater awareness of her significance for us, and also towards promoting comparative research that would build cross-cultural links between South Asia and the larger world. Some of Lessing's work has already been translated into some Indian languages, but much more remains to be done. Perhaps DLSSA can take this up as a mission to promote. It would be interesting to imagine how South Asian criticism of Doris Lessing might evolve if her works are read in relation to South Asian writings and also through the lens of indigenous literary concepts and debates. The issue of pedagogy is also pertinent. Reading Lessing in South Asian classrooms in new and innovative ways can be a stimulating and productive process. Instead of confining Lessing to the English literature syllabus, it is worth including her writings also in the curriculum of other subjects in the humanities, such as comparative literature, sociology, gender studies, women's studies, and post-colonial studies. I'm happy to see that the papers to be presented at this webinar make important connections between Lessing's work and the concerns of writers in South Asia and beyond and address significant contemporary topical issues related to diverse discourses, including eco-criticism, philosophy, spirituality, feminism, gender, and sexuality. Lessing calls her writing an instrument of change. It is for us to collectively reconsider and adopt her legacy as a potential instrument of change in our own embattled worlds. Thank you. I thank Dr. Ratha Chakraborty for setting the tone of this webinar with a very apt uh, articulation on the topic of this webinar. Since it is not customary to have questions after the keynote, I would thank her once again and move straight to the first business session. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take your leave. I wish the seminar all success. Thank you. In the first business session, we have two speakers, uh, Umesh Kumar from the University of Karnataka, Dharwad, India, and Shonindu Dam, who has been with, uh, with an independent researcher right now. Uh, I would like to begin with Umesh Kumar. Is Umesh Kumar? Uh, yes. Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm here. Let me... I'm here. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, introduce the speaker. Umesh Kumar is a postgraduate in English language and literature from St. Joseph's College, Bangalore. He has a postgraduate diploma. He has a postgraduate diploma in journalism and mass communications from Bhartiya Vidya Bhavan, Bangalore. A gold medalist in MA, his academic interests extend to the disciplines of film studies, theatre studies, British literature, European studies, postcolonial studies cultural studies and science fiction. At present, he is a PhD scholar at the Karnataka State University, Harvard, and has been working on a unique project that blends literature and the Indian classical dance So, uh, may I request you to begin your presentation? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, very good evening to all the dignitaries uh, who have joined this webinar. Um, well, uh, the title of uh, my research uh, article is existentialism in Doris Lessing's is, uh, The Grass is Singing and uh, Anita Desai's Cry the Peacock 
or comparative study. Let me begin uh, my presentation with a quote by Herman Hesse. I quote, I realize today that nothing in the world is more distasteful to a man than to take the path that leads to himself. I am quote. How true. Uh, well, excuse me, is it possible to uh, speak a little louder or increase the volume? Um, okay, so just a second. Just a second. Yeah, now am I audible? Ma also, also, we can't see half of your face. So, if you can adjust your position a little, okay. that would be helpful. Yes, huh. now? Yes. What about now? No. Am I, am I audible now? You are, uh, yeah. uh, yes, yes, that's better. Thank you. Okay, fine. Now, uh, well, uh, the topic focuses on existentialism. Uh, in the works of uh, Doris Lessing and uh, Anita Desai. Well, why I chose uh, for a com to go for a comparative study? The reason is uh, a very interesting one. Um, because Doris Lessing's work, I wanted to prove uh, how relevant reading and re-readings of uh, Doris Lessing is uh, important to the uh, current time. This is what I would like to establish with the uh, comparative study of uh, Anita Desai's cry. Um, uh, Anita Desai's uh, novel, Cry the Peacock, Voices from the City. Uh, well, um, The Grass is Singing by Doris Lessing, that, sh that was published in the year 1950, could be read from various perspectives. Psychoanalytical study of uh, the grass is singing being the more uh, uh, interesting one. I have chosen the perspective of uh, existentialism. Uh, well, I would like to make it very clear uh, how existentialism and existentialist philosophies are interchangeably used, the terms, I mean, uh, in fact, there is a fine line between the two, existentialism and uh, existentialist philosophy. Existentialism was popularized uh, as a movement by Saharan Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky and uh, Frederick Nietzsche. Whereas existentialist as a philosophy was popularized by Jean-Paul Sartre. This is the fundamental under understanding before we proceed any further into my uh, presentation. Well, uh, the protagonists of both uh, Doris Lessing as well as Anita Desai in their respective works, Mary Turner from The Grass is Singing and Maya Gautam from Cry the Peacock, uh, they, they commonly suffer from alienation, what Kaufman probably calls timeless sensibility that may be distinguished here and there is the past. Human's autonomy, assertion of the subjective self, denial of conventional values, life's absurdity, nothingness are the major themes common to both Doris Lessing and uh, Anita Desai. The point to be noted here is, it's a very interesting observation that the times are different. The times during which Doris Lessing came up with this novel and articulated her inner thoughts. Whereas Anita Desai's time frame of uh, writing the novel Cry the Peacock is again different. Ani um, Doris Lessing, the approach was more of a post-colonial and Anita Desai's approach of writing Cry the Peacock is more of a post-modernist approach. Well, this is the fundamental understanding uh, for the comparative study. Uh, both uh, Doris Lessing and Anita Desai wrestle with an uh, endless search for uh, significance, word, freedom, and truth. For them, I mean for both of them, existence precedes essence. The non-conformist attitudes of both Lessing and Desai indicate that reality is intolerable. Well, examining the grass is singing by Doris Lessing, it seems to be semi-autobiographical and uh, Doris Lessing follows stream of consciousness while writing the novel. The readers uh, surely feel that. Uh, the protagonist of The Grass is Singing, Mary Turner, how she meeting um, a white woman. What are her inner thoughts? What are her inner dilemmas? Why is she so disappointed with the life despite being a British woman in South Africa? And her inner fears, her dilemmas, her psychological disturbances were uh, the readers feel somewhere were also experienced by Doris Lessing 
going by her uh, biography, a carved or slicing for uh, she was born to a British parents in Iran and how she moved for the, uh, to uh, today's uh, Zimbabwe, that was Harari way back, uh, for her studies and how she had to cut uh, abruptly her studies at the age of 13 and she was self-educated later. Uh, at the age of 15, she started working in Doris Lessing as a nursemaid. And later she took up a job of a telephone operator in Salisbury. Mm. And uh, at, the age, at the age of 18, and uh, she got married to a gentleman. It was a short-lived marriage of, say, for about uh, five, six years. And she gave birth to uh, two children, Jean and John. And uh, this illusion by Married to Life, she applied for a divorce, which she got eventually. And uh, she married for the second time at the age of 26. And uh, she gave birth to another boy called Peter. Uh, unfortunately, the second marriage was also short-lived. This, the kind of uh, her disillusionments with the institution of marriage is so convincingly reflected in The Grass is Singing, wherein the protagonist also strongly feels that disillusionment, that alienation from the institution of marriage. Her expectations are shattered all of a sudden despite uh, getting married to a white man. And uh, the kind of her feelings whenever she spots the uh, black uh, Africans for blacks, of course, she loathes the very sight of uh, African women. She cannot just stun. Uh, the readers feel that um, um, the protagonist of the grass is singing, Mary Turner, she's torn between uh, colonialist attitudes and also the humanity, the compassionate side of uh, womanhood. She's torn between the two, what to follow, what not to follow. In the process, she is shattered, psychologically disturbed. Now, the process of introspection is important in postmodern times. To quote Jean Paul, to quote uh, Jean Paul Sartre, I quote: "One is not what one is, and one is what one is not." Well, I'm reminded of a sociologist's uh, statement, wherein uh, he says, "I quote: I am not what I think. I am not what you think I am. I am not what I think I am." I am what you think I think I am. Well, I unquote. It's a very meaningful statement that could be understand, uh, that could be understood uh, from uh, within the framework of being uh, existentialist. Existentialism is this is what it's truly unmasking your real self and introspecting who we are. What is the purpose of life? Both the protagonists of these wonderful women writers do the same thing including the writers themselves at one point of time. Otherwise, it is not so easy to reflect or portray uh, the existentialism as a movement and you base your novel on that. Uh, that's what uh, the uh, secret of success and why even today, Doris Lessing is read and read it across the globe like uh, Shakespeare. Probably this could be one of the uh, reasons. As a writer, Anita Desai examines the dual alienation experienced by both the husband and wife engendered by temperamental incompatibility in her novel that was published in the year 1963, Cry the Peacock. Similar to Ma uh, Mary Turner, Maya Gautam in Cry the Peacock is also one disillusioned woman, a product of post-modernist times. Uh, she being a quintessential Indian woman, Maya Gautam, uh, the protagonist of Cry the Peacock, she feels disillusioned again with the institution of marriage. Uh, much she gets married to a much elderly man called Gotham, her father's friend, and how in the process she feels she's like disappointed with the cold attitude of uh, her husband. Uh, he being a uh, uh, he, he works as a software engineer, and so completely uh, he never reciprocates to the soft and womanly feelings of Maya Gotham. Like uh, she she is in the same space as uh, Mary Turner in the grass of singing. Well, at one point of time, she's so fascinated anymore by the neighborhood uh, uh, peacock's cries, wherein uh, the uh, shrieks of peacock, uh, she hears it as pia, pia, and she wants her husband to listen to the same and reciprocate to the uh, call of a peacock, which he doesn't, uh, unfortunately. While her pet dog dies, his attitude is so nonchalant out of which she decides enough is enough. A man who is so insensitive to the death of a pet dog, so how can I, how could I reciprocate, uh, expect him to reciprocate to my feelings? 
this is what existentialism uh, is about, what it talks about. What does it mean to be existing as a human being? This is one prominent question what uh, both the protagonists and also the writers uh, encounter. Being human is finding oneself thrown into a world with no uh, clear logical, ontological or moral order, yearning for orientation and purpose in our lives, yet the decisive answers to unachievable. Lessing and Desai's, uh, Desai characterize existentialism as a style of philosophizing rather than a philosophy. This is what the understanding of existentialism as a movement. They are not presenting any philosophy in their works, in their oeuvre uh, of uh, writings. Well, they are philosophizing life rather than a, a philosophy. Well, human mind, when faced with the doubts and anxieties of life, phrases for its recesses of a pre-conscious level of human psyche, both Mary Turner and Maya's obsession. Um, discontented womanhood, the isolation, emotional unrest, debilitated partner, make them existential in their behavior. Growing insanity and neurotic conduct brings in disaster into their lives, wherein uh, Maya Gotham finally ends up Throwing, uh, thrusting her husband from the rooftop and uh, he's killed instantly. And uh, there, in the grass is sinking, Mary Turner gets killed by her domestic help, who's an African man. Uh, she, in a moment of uh, heat, she would have a affair, an affair with this African domestic help, which she could not accept that her body, white, pure body, was touched by an African uh, black man. So that constant uh, uh, guilt fear ultimately kills her. The same uh, African black man uh, ends her, I mean, um, kills her. Uh, both the protog women protagonists, they die in the process of confusion and psychological dilemmas, asking themselves with constant introspection. Well, this is what the readers feel. How important is introspection? It is not just restricted to the characters of uh, uh, the novels of uh, Doris Lessing. This is what the biggest takeaway of uh, reading and rereading uh, Doris Lessing, even today in the 21st century. Mm. Well, uh, this this uh, mm, so completely urges the readers to introspect ourselves and to ask the same questions, surprisingly the same set of questions what the protagonists ask in the novels to themselves, of course, both uh, Maya Gotham and uh, Doris Lessing's is Mary Turner in The Grass is Singing. Uh, why uh, I mentioned like, uh, uh, grass is singing could be understood and read as semi-autobiographical. Uh, the Doris Lessing's work, she brings in and infuses her uh, feelings and her uh, experiences, what she had uh, during her um, youth, during her uh, her growing up years and formative years, and how and why that counts as important. And she mentions why and how having the moral luck, uh, children, to be have uh, born in a in a happy family, it's she terms it as moral luck uh, because uh, Doris Lessing's mother, uh, who was also a Britisher, she was working as a nurse where uh, her father, her parents had met each other uh, in London in a hospital. Mm. Uh, she, uh, her mother, Doris Lessing's mother, was a chronic uh, alcoholic, uh, which uh, Doris Lessing mentions somewhere. And she says she never wanted to end up like her mother. Uh, her failed first marriage where she had two children, she was not ready to look after them because she thought for it would be it would be such a, a difficult uh, task for a woman who she was also urging to blossom out as a blossom as a writer. Uh, should she give up uh, the idea of bringing up her uh, children from first marriage? Uh, and she surrendered them to her first husband, of course, mm -hmm. and she took the divorce. So this shows how a modern woman is raring to go. Uh, like I'm reminded of Bucci Emecheta's uh, Joys of Motherhood. Ironically, she says, Joys of Motherhood is not, the title suggests that, but it should not be understood that uh, being a mother is not the be all and end all goal of every woman. As it is said, being a woman is natural, but being a mother is divine. Well, this statement is counter countered and counter argued by Bucci Emecheta. Well, it's not necessary. A woman without giving birth biologically to children can still get the fulfillment 
can feel you know why uh, women expect or look up to uh, of being appendage a male appendage to a man this is what one of the biggest questions uh, that raises uh, out of uh, this novel the grass is singing probably mary turner uh, the, all the wrong decisions whatever she had taken if for a moment she had introspected she had uh, got into the stream of existentialism and uh, she had uh, attempted to seek answers from within this is what the best part of uh, existentialism uh, movement and uh, existentialism movement being infused uh, into uh, the literature and there's a new literary genre wherein uh, taking in all the elements of existentialism and existentialist uh, uh, philosophy uh, it's a new genre that would uh, throw more light on understanding and introspection uh, the the wonderful part of uh, Doris Lessing's novel is not like you finish reading the novel, just uh, close the book, and then uh, no, it's not that. Uh, that is the point because for Doris Lessing, human being is a starting point. This is what the best part of uh, uh, reading Doris Lessing's novel. Uh, one would start thinking and rethinking about life, about oneself, about the purpose of life. Uh, it, it doesn't get just restricted to the Uh, the theme of the novel, the central theme of the novel, or uh, the characters portrayed—they are not fictitious. They are real. They are here, and they are for us. Uh, this is how uh, Doris Lessing's novel. You can just compare any best of novel from across the globe and juxtapose with uh, Doris Lessing's uh, other novels as well. That would still be relevant and would make a very good comparative study. Uh, this is what i mean this is one reason why i chose uh, to adopt the perspective of uh, existentialism how would that be to examine doris lessing's work from the uh, uh, from the consciousness of uh, existentialism how would the characters the protagonists uh, do take uh, the uh, the burden of uh, this particular movement and in what way could i engage uh, with the existential conversation Uh, with the characters, with the protagonist of uh, her novel, and probably with herself, uh, this is what uh, I I could understand how and why her novels, or somewhere especially the grass is singing, is definitely semi-autobiographical. The kind of uh, uh, her uh, the the feelings, the dilemmas, especially while she had worked as a telephone operator at the age of eighteen, uh, I guess, in Salisbury. Uh, she has translated all those uh, inner feelings, inner turmoils, her fears into this novel. The grass is singing. She speaks through her protagonist, Mary Turner. This is what, uh, like as you know, the stream of consciousness. One would feel: Is it a? Is it uh, Doris Lessing herself speaking, or her protagonist, Mary Turner? This is the kind of impact Doris Lessing brings in to her uh, novel. The grass is singing. And in comparison, Anita Desai's *Cry the Peacock* also uh, establishes and uh, reaffirms the fact that Doris Lessing is just timeless. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Umesh Kumar. Uh, we will take the questions uh, at the end of our papers. But right now, sure, sure. Uh, I would invite Shaudan Budham to present his paper. Uh, Shaudan Budham uh, is an independent researcher, currently working on the marginalization of communities found in speculative dystopian narratives and its connection with socio-political material realities. He completed his graduation from Bidhanagar Government College under West Bengal State University in 2020 and post graduation from West Bengal State University with a gold medal in 2022 he qualified UGC net during the third semester of post graduation uh, he is an associate member of the Center for Studies in Gender Culture and Media at West Bengal State University and he has presented research papers in several national and international seminars and webinars He is currently working as a research assistant under Dr. Omijit Paul from the University of California, Berkeley, uh, on a project on environmental and community 
justice. Uh, Shonin, this paper is titled Countering Dystopia with Spiritual Awakening, exploring the socio-psychological uh, significance of mysticism in lessons, the memoirs of a survivor. So over to Shonin. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I would like to uh, share my screen. I have made a, a presentation, so uh, just give me some time. Uh, is it visible? Yes, yes, it is visible. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, I would like to start now. Uh, I would like to first start with a, a Buddhist folklore. Uh, once Gautama Buddha was asked by one of his disciples whether Gautama is certain that he will go to heaven, Gautama replied that he does not want to go to heaven. Everything is peaceful and blissful in heaven. So instead, he wants to go to hell where people require him the most. This is the very, this is a very famous Buddhist plot and the very gist of my today's talk. Uh, so good evening everyone, I am Sornendu. Today I am going to talk about the need for spirituality in a dystopian society in the context of blessings, the memoirs of a survivor. Uh, now Doris Lessing uh, in the memoirs of a survivor presents a dystopian future where society has broken down due to the crisis. My paper explores number one how the spirituality how spirituality can bring the necessary equilibrium or harmony in a socially degenerative and psychologically chaotic dystopian society that is relegated to the margins. And number two, the Sufi allegories to the narrator's mystic and visionary excursions into quote uh, I'm quoting the other world. My analysis will not be restricted to Sufism in particular, rather it will include mystical or spiritual ideas of other Eastern philosophies like Hinduism, Buddhism and Taoism as Lessing observes and I'm quoting all religions and types of mysticism say the same thing in different words. Uh, first, I would like to talk about different phases in Lessing's literary career and the connection between them. Uh, so, Lessing seeks a harmonious interaction between the rational, psychological, and spiritual modes of perceiving the reality in both her personal life and her writings as well. Lessing's narrative techniques uh, correspondingly encompasses uh, realistic modes as well as speculative and mythic techniques. Lessing's fiction is, a, is commonly divided into three distinct phases. During her communist phase of writing, she concentrated on how one's the intellectual, uh, by the intellectual, social, and material circumstances of the period. In her psychological phase, she elaborates on, on the necessity of a shift inward, a descent into the unconscious. And in her Sufi phase, in which memoirs is written, Blessing, realize, uh, Blessing realizes that the only way for human beings to break down, uh, to break free from predetermined reputation and avoid catastrophe is via the fullest development of their faculties. Uh, now, from the age of enlightenment through various interactions of Marxism, humanistic thought has been based on belief, uh, has been based on the belief that the power of reason may lead uh, to human liberation. The idea that there may be a system of social organization in which each individual's potential can be fully realized is the main theme of Marxist strategy. According to Marx, an individual's troubles will be solved if his uh, circumstances let him fully realize his potential as a social uh, creature. On the other hand, humanistic psychology has looked to the unrealized potential of the unconscious which it claims uh, is the root of individual's estrangement and sense of hopelessness. Uh, we may draw the logical connection from this and determine the justification for Lessing's partial adherence to Marxism and Jungian psychodynamics. Uh, Lessing's steadfast pursuit of balancing route led her to investigate Jungian and Langian psychology and ultimately brought her to Sufism. The notion of Jungian psychology are, uh, are, compl uh, are complemented by Lang's view that Western man is estranged from society and divided within himself, 
can and can only be saved through an inner journey the fact that psychiatry is restricted to the domain of science uh, limits the work of hume from exploring the realm of the higher consciousness it is the realm of the higher consciousness explored by sufi philosophy which according to shadia s fahim is the motive of ascent to higher levels of perception to a transcendental realm referred to by the sufis as tajalli a state indicating a breakthrough of the limitations of time and space uh now the sufis assert in order to reach the state of uh, state known as tajalli in which a person surpasses the confines of ordinary experience one must activate the latifa an incipient organ of spiritual awareness lessing observes that man has the capacity for conscious self development becoming capable uh, with his own efforts and under a certain kind of expert guidance of transcending common uh, limitations lessing's mysticism is not a retreat into a mode which is regressive irrational and religious uh, but it indicates a seriousness uh, of her commitment because it is a means of deepening her understanding of the nature of the world we live in and strengthening the hope in the potential of the individual to serve mankind from the beginning of her career lessing has been interested in finding ways to help individuals which they are fullest potential it is the driving force behind her canon acts as the link between her commitment to marxist theory the psychology of jung and sufi philosophical thought uh, in that context maintaining the harmony or equilibrium between three poles of reality the rational psychological and intuitive becomes a becomes the preferred way to view life from a multi layered mode or mode of perception now i would like to talk about the uh, talk about dystopia and cacophony and the need for spiritual harmony uh, now dystopia which is usually understood to be utopia's 20th century doppelganger best exemplified by science and political fiction a dystopia is a hypothetical unwanted or terrifying group of culture it is frequently used as an opposite opposite of utopia a term said thomas more point uh, <coughs> so environmental catastrophe uh, despotic governments widespread anxiety or distress and other threats indicative of uh, dystopias the story of lessing's memoirs take place in a future britain where society has broken down due to an unspecified disaster referred to as the crisis by the start of the novel the situation in the society is starting to deteriorate uh, as the edifice of the past society crumbles many aspects of the old civilizations are still there in the new society that develops after the collapse but it is fundamentally different empty shelves and people leaving the city are the are two signs of a good a uh, scarcity mentioned in the uh, uh, mentioned by the narrator there is rationing uh, there is rationing in that place in the dystopian society and when gangs move block by block through the city and target the local people the entity that functions as the post crisis nations government is unable to solidify its power and has little influence over the public while schools for the poor serve as an army apparatus and are created to control the populace education is available to those uh, who pose a will as the who pose as the wealthier survivors although there is still little commercial activity finding unusual products requires scavenging uh, so it gives us a picture of uh, the future society uh, which is a kind of completely uh, gone to rocks now the question comes uh, in a dystopia why spiritual equilibrium or spiritual seeking is needed at all the equilibrium between the cognitive psychological and intuitive abilities is completely destroyed in a dystopian society the first requirement for surviving in the dystopian society is to restore the balance first one can separate one can separate themselves psychologically from their environment through spiritual awakening which helps him 
which helps him or her remain composed under a pressure situation. Since one cannot change the external reality in a dystopian condition, one might learn to accept his external reality by adjusting his internal one. Lessing's, familiar, uh, Lessing's familiarity with Sufism began uh, when she became a student of the Sufi master Idris Shah, following her uh, completion of the Golden Notebook. It was an important period in Lessing's life, during which she felt disappointed with her earlier involvement in communism and other Western ideology like materialism. Lessing then set out to look for a new path to salvation. The guide Lessing found uh, in the Sufi master Idris Shah, whom Lessing sought out several times before Shah ultimately agreed to, to be her mentor. <coughs> Lessing, a writer with uh, Sufi influences, believes that the only way for humans to break free from uh, planned recurrence and avoid tragedy is through the fullest development and balancing of all their faculties. If we don't get our faculties back in balance, she fears the worst for the future of the human race, probably creating a dystopia. The fundamental principle of Sufi philosophy is to cultivate intuitive modes of consciousness to balance out the rational mode in order to attain harmony between the rational and non-rational modes of consciousness. The Sufis believe that when man's understanding is one-dimensional and restricted to only intellectual ways of cognition, the one-dimensional mode prevents alternative forms of consciousness, which limits it not uh, which which limits, if not distorts, our perception, our fullest perception of reality. According to Lessing, the Sufi path is a source of wisdom that can help individuals overcome their limited cognitive abilities as a key to a deeper comprehension of reality, enabling them to act on reality more effectively. And if that reality is dystopian, then uh, that would be, I think, better as uh, Sufism will work better in those conditions. Uh, so there is a passage that is written by uh, uh, Doris Lessing, uh, which uh, where she talks about the necessity of uh, Sufism in those crisis situations. Uh, now I would like to talk about the, the mystic allegories that we can find in the memoirs of a survivor. Uh, Nancy is hurting. Uh, Nancy is heard in an article, Doris Lessing and the Sufi way comments that there are two groups of characters in memoirs. Firstly, those who are acutely aware of the tragedy and its terrible effects and who perceive their current existential predicament as a bondage that they must escape. And the second group, those who are unaware of this bondage. The female narrator falls under the first category. She is not only aware of the apparent collapse of uh, civilization as a result of some sort of natural <laughs> catastrophe, but she is also perceptive enough to see its true uh, to see its true root, which is not so much the natural disaster as it is inhabitants. Storage space is an issue in every house. Okay, sorry, there was a noise. I think. Okay, so as I was saying, that the female narrator falls under the first category. Uh, she is not only aware of the apparent collapse of civilization as a result of some sort of natural catastrophe, but she is also perceptive enough to see its true root, which is not so much the natural disaster as it as it is the inhabitants' ignorance and incapacity to escape from their bonds. Now, this idea of bond and our ignorance towards these bonds is uh, uh, relates to the idea of maya or illusion that is found in the mystic branches of Hinduism. Maya having its roots in Rig Veda and Atharva Veda has multiple meanings in Indian philosophies and uh, but philosophies depending on the context. Maya denotes that which is constantly changing and thus is spiritually unreal, in opposition to an unchanging absolute, which in Sanskrit we call Brahman, and therefore conceals and therefore Maya conceals the true character of spiritual reality. 
in the advaita vedanta school of hindu philosophy maya is the powerful force that creates the cosmic illusion that the phenomenal world is real lin paulston states the world is both real and unreal because it exists uh, because it exists but is not what it appears to be according to uh, wendy uh, doniger to say that the universe is an illusion is not to say that it is unreal it is to say instead that it is not what it seems to be that it is something constantly being made maya not only deceives people from the things they think uh, from the things uh, they think they know more basically it limits their knowledge uh, there is an image that i uh, got from internet and there the source mentioned okay now as the narrator is isolated from her two neighbors by walls uh, there is a wall in the uh, there is a wall in the novel that separates two different walls wall that i will talk about later uh, so lessing uses walls as one of the symbols to represent the bounds of space since we have lived among and around walls our entire lives ordinary people would likely view them as nothing unusual but the narrator has unique sentiments for them and is uh, acutely aware of their symbolic significance this wall creates a threshold between two worlds the personal world the world of puppets and prisoners and there is an impersonal world the world of lightness freedom and possibility the female protagonist travel between the two worlds is suggestive of a person who is developing original connections between various levels of perception and who has subsequently found a favorable way of survival in hinduism this kind of movement represents the mystic idea of astral projection while one is in a meditative state astral projection is a term used in esoteric esotericism uh, to describe an inten uh, intentional out of body experience that assumes the existence of a subtle body called astral body through which consciousness can function separately from physical body and travel through ast astral plane early concepts of subtle body or in sanskrit sukshma sharira appeared in the upanishads including uh, uh, okay Uh, the Taittiriya Upanishad describes the theory of five koshas or sits. Uh, those uh, uh, the Taittiriya Upanishad describes the th uh, the theory of five koshas. Yeah, five koshas, and those are called uh, as you can see in the uh, PPT: uh, the Annamaya Kosha, the Pranamaya Kosha, the Manomaya Kosha, and the Vigyanamaya Kosha, and the Anandamaya Kosha. So. similar ideas such as linga sharira and uh, linga sharira are found in ancient hindu scriptures such as the yoga vasishta mahabharata of valmiki astral projection is one of the siddhis which are material paranormal or supernatural or otherwise magical powers or abilities and attainments that are products of yogic advancement through sadhanas such as meditation and yoga So there is a quote uh, by Indian spiritual teacher Meher Baba who described uh, one of such uh, astral projections and how uh, this thing works. I'm not uh, going to read uh, the entirety. Okay. Now the I think most interesting part of uh, of this uh, of the conception of uh, mysticism in uh memoirs there is the wall separating the two uh, the two wall the wall separating the two walls at the end becomes a screen of forest through which emily gerald her boyfriend and their dog walk through into the other world and open space under the thunders and clearing clouds so the submergence of the world in a sufi context by activating latifa an incipient organ of spiritual perception to achieve the state of tajalli in which the characters of memoirs ultimately transcends the limitation of physical space and time 
Now, Latifa are spiritual are special organs of perception in Sufi spiritual psychology of subtle human capacities for experience and action. So, Latifa in Arabic means subtlety. Uh, subtle body concepts and practices can be identified as early as second century BC in Taoist texts as well found in uh, Mawangudi uh, tomb, uh, tombs. Uh, which is uh, quoted by Samuel and Johnston, Taoist, alchemal, uh, alchem, uh, Taoist alchemical practice involves creation of an energy body by breathing meditations, drawing energy into a pearl, is then circulated. Similarly, uh, I, would, uh, I know I think I'm overshooting a little bit, so I'm just taking two minutes. I will uh, just talk about this interesting thing that this idea of... Uh, this idea of Tajilla is also related with the Baul Parampara or the Baul Sahajiya Parampara, which is influenced by Tantric philosophy, Sahajiya Vaishnavism, Shakta Yoga, and Sufism. It is believed that the discovery of inner self is possible, uh, is, po uh, is possible the awakening of the supreme energy hidden in Kundalini. So there is a relationship between Kundalini and Tajilla. The belief uh, held that human life simultaneously exists in two parallel dimensions. Firstly, the Thula Sharira and secondly, the Shukshma Sharira. The psyche or the mind plane corresponds to, uh, to, corresponds to and interacts with the body plane. And the belief holds that the body and the mind mutually affect each other. Uh, following Professor Madhukandan, an eminent Tantric scholar from Oxford, Arup Kumar Bhag, in his article, Shahajiya Lalun Kavya, uh, exploring the essence of Kundalini Yoga with special reference to the selected lyrics of uh, Fakir Lalonsha writes that Kundal Kundalini is a hierarchic, uh, hierarchical astral structure that resides within the human body from the bottom of spine to brain. It contains several chakras. They are Muladhar, Swadhisthan, Manipur, Anahala, Vishuddha, Akriya, Agya, and uh, Shash. Uh, Agya and uh, Shahar, uh, Shahar Kundalini is in uh, Kundalini is an unconscious state uh, which is under yoga, that is eternal sleep and can be awakened through rigorous disciplinary austere practices that can boost the supreme energy to spread in the body and to uplift the soul into a spiritual plane. Uh, so there are also other references that I will not uh, go because of I think I have overshot the time. Like there is pranayama and murakabha. So pranayama is related to Hinduism, especially uh, Shahajiya Baul tradition, and murakabha is directly related to Sufism. Basically, these are the techniques by which uh, we can get what is called tajalli and kundalini jagara simultaneously. Uh, and there is also mention of uh, spiritual guide, importance of spiritual guide uh, in the in, in uh, memoirs. We can see uh, the character, the figure of the one who ultimately leads all the characters through the world uh, into kind of an utopian space. And in different uh, and in different spiritual traditions, be it uh, Sufism, Taoism, Buddhism, or Hinduism, we all know and understand the importance of guru. The importance of spiritual guide that uh, they have. Uh, so I would uh, like to conclude. Uh, so I would like to conclude by saying that listening in memoirs investigates a new conception of reality in which the bizarre and the everyday coexist. The female protagonist travel between the two worlds is suggestive of a person who is developing creative connections between various levels of perception and who has subsequently discovered a favorable way of surviving. I end my presentation here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shonindu. Uh, well, I'll just sum up very briefly, very quickly. Now, Umesh Kumar has spoken about how uh, the Protagonists in Lessing and Anita Desai often suffer from social isolation, alienation, and how this sense of estrangement from society uh, leads to a state of uh, frustration and finally to an epiphanic revelation of, of self-knowledge. And Shonindu has chosen uh, work from Doris Lessing's Sufi face to argue 
that combating the sense of a dystopic reality is possible only through spiritual awakening. Now it's time, I mean, we are ready for taking questions. If there are questions, please uh, either you can type it or uh, in the chat box, or uh, if you have uh, questions from people who are in the meet, then we are going to take direct questions. Yes. Uh, are there questions? Uh, in a way, I find this is just a comment that the papers are somehow linked because both are talking about self knowledge in a I mean, coming to the protagonist in one uh, way or another. Uh, yes, Shati, I think you wanted to say something. Yes, um, I just had to, um, not even questions, but maybe observations. But Shanindu, I was just thinking whether you could um, think of this paper uh, without the Sufi element at all. Like, you know, just use it maybe as some kind of a um, supporting uh, theory which, because it is already done. But given that you have hit on the bowel thing, uh, something which I had also when I was doing my research on Lessing had seen the possibility of the Sufi being uh, used and the bowel too being used. And since you've done so much on the bowel, uh, maybe a, a, a very, very Bengali uh, reading of the Mamas could go over with the bowel reading, even without the, because uh, you could see the bowel and Sufi connect, but... Um, bringing it together, what would you say? Ma'am, I actually thought about that, uh, that thing that I will only focus on uh, the bowel element, but I had to just, I like while I was structuring my paper, I thought, uh, I found that I had to justify that why spirituality is needed in a dystopian world. And when I talk about uh, spirituality from Lessing's point of view, like why uh, like Lessing has chosen uh, to make a dystopian society because he is justifying because she is justifying that in that dystopian society that we find in memoirs, spirituality is needed the most. So I thought if I just keep uh, Sufism, I will not be able to make the balance that uh, that I'm talking about the Sufi equilibrium that Sufism or spirituality is not taking that I will not consider reality or psychological aspects, but it is a balance between between the intelligence, the psychological aspect, and the spiritual aspect. So I thought that if I have to justify that thing, uh, I, I, I had to put uh, like why she has chosen Sufism and the balance uh, between that, I think. Like how I have conceived to structure my paper. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a question rather, question, compliment. Uh, do you think that so much of Vedantic philosophy and the concept of Kundalini and the awakening of the Kundalini, which is part of a very uh, a specific kind of uh, religious spiritual practice, do you think that really relates to a writer like Doris Lessing? I mean, this is something that I would love to know. Ma'am, actually, uh, there yes, uh, I have a yeah, ma'am. Uh, ma Doris Lessing actually quoted one of uh, ones that I have also quoted that I, I have forgotten the quote, I have to find it, but uh, she's saying that uh, all the religions and spirituality, if we spiritual sects and spiritual practices, if we study about them, they are kind of saying the same thing in different words. And I was actually trying to focus on that, like how different spiritual practices, be it Taoism, Buddhism, Hinduism, like Vedan Vedantism in uh, Hindu philosophy, or if I talk about Shahaji Baul tradition, how they are linking. And I was surprised, like I was first doing my research and I, when I like read it for like quite a few days, I was surprised that the, how the conception of uh, Kundalini and uh, the conception of Kundalini, which is completely a Shahaji Baul tradition. And we, sometimes we uh, remember it in like yoga, yogic philosophy. And how the structure of that Kundalini, the seven uh, serpent-like things, and 
is Kundalini mm-hmm. part of the Bau tradition? Or is, yes, it, is it part of a Tantric yogic practice? Ma'am, Shahojiya Baul. Shahojiya Baul is, uh, is uh, like, Shahojiya Baul takes their ideas, their spiritual uh, practices, sadhanas from different sects, from Vaishnavism, from Yoga, from Sufism as well. So there is a relationship between that Kundalini and what I call the Tajilla. The Tajalli thing is kind, kind of the same, uh, like there are five uh, levels that I could not talk about because of time constraint and it was not possible to speak about so much things in like 15-20 minutes and I uh, overshoot. But if that kind of comparative study can be done, uh, like there are quite a lot of similarities. Even in Kundalini, we can see that there are Odhishthatri Devota or Odhishthatri Devi Boli. In, in Kundalini. Yes. Also linked like a prophet, Adam, Jesus, and all different kinds of prophets with the stages. So there is a kind of link that we can also study if, if we do a comparative study. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other question? Uh, else we will move to the next session and I will hand over the, the responsibility of conducting it to Dr. Ujjalji. Uh, I would like to comment on uh, what Swarnendu uh, said. Uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, he uh, touched upon a number of things uh, um, and made a very nice comparison of uh, 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 like uh, Indian philosophical systems, uh, then um, Sufism, and then Lessing's insight, uh, insights uh, into it. Uh, but one thing which I felt that uh, uh, like you could add to it was uh, uh, the concept of love. Uh, because as uh, I understand uh, Sufism, uh, the concept of love is very central uh, to uh, Sufism and even the bhakti tradition of uh, 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 Indian ethos. So uh, in uh, Sufi uh, culture, they, they call it uh, that uh, uh, in order to reach God, uh, the human love is basically a, a, a ladder a kind of uh, uh, a way to reach uh, the love with God. So uh, like it is called Ishq Majaji and Ishq Hakiki, uh, if you've heard of it. So uh, the, uh, and similarly, if you see, I mean, in Lessing's uh, books also, nowhere uh, right from Children uh, of Violence uh, and the early uh, books like uh, the, Gold, uh, the Golden Notebook, uh, she also focuses on uh, love. I mean, nowhere uh, the women characters of uh, Lessing's fiction, uh, they j- reject the concept of love. So probably, I mean, uh, that was one thing uh, in which she uh, uh, like focused on when she said that she is, uh, I mean, not that kind of a feminist uh, who is rejecting uh, a woman's experience of womanhood. So, I mean, uh, uh, that kind of a comparison can also be made, added to your paper, uh, where the concept of love, uh, the concept of ishq in uh, Sufism, and the concept of uh, uh, love in bhakti uh, movement of uh, Indian tradition, and then uh, love as blessing views it. So that can also be added in your uh, paper, yes. Absolutely, ma'am. Actually, uh, like if we uh, talk about like uh, if we talk about the four kind of yogas that uh, our Hinduism or like yogic culture they, they promote, there, there is uh, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, gyan yoga, and kriya yoga. So I have perceived this spirituality from a particularly kriya yoga per- perspective. I have I have not touched what because we can then also talk about bhakti yoga, maybe gyan yoga, or karma yoga. I don't know. So yeah, it's a very interesting thing that we can also, like, apart from the Kriya Yoga, that is completely a spiritual, like, that you have to meditate, sadhana, kriya, all these kinds of things. We can also go to Bhakti Yoga and particularly think about this concept of love as Bhakti and Bhakti traditions of Hinduism and maybe if other other religions or other 
cultures as well, philosophical thoughts. Yeah. Definitely. So, like, uh, if if you uh, read poetry of Sain Gulesha or uh, Shah Hussain and uh, Varis Shah, so uh, in all these literary texts, you will see that uh, love with a human being actually is seen as uh, um, the uh, alternative, or maybe I mean, uh, a step into uh, reaching um, the love with God Almighty. So. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And another thing, I mean, this is an observation and um, not exactly an observation. In fact, I just want to comment upon uh, Dr. Radha Chakarbarti's um, uh, keynote address. I mean, it was really very, very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, very scholarly. And I mean, she uh, touched upon um, practically every single issue which uh, can be explored uh, with respect to lessing and with respect to uh, I I Indian uh, um, cultural and literary traditions. So I mean, uh, beginning with heteronormative behaviors, uh, then uh, the forced homogeneity, and then uh, the Western pragmatics versus Eastern ethos of transcendence, um, then uh, the colonial uh, past as well as uh, the interaction of, uh, in, rather intersection of uh, racism. Uh, I mean, number of things I have actually noted them down here. Western uh, formations of marginality, how they are different from uh, the Indian intersectionality, the issues of uh, the issues which uh, primarily concern us uh, in South Asian re uh, region. So, uh, like uh, very very uh, specific to this area, which is uh, the caste. Uh, issue. So, uh, I mean, um, I really like uh, the keynote address because I, I th found it very eclectic, touching everything and in fact giving us opportunities to further explore uh, all these areas which she mentioned in a very uh, brief uh, talk, but uh, like uh, everything uh, which possibly can uh, be an area of interest under this. Um, also, I mean, uh, I, I liked, and, uh, in fact, we had right from the beginning, we had been talking about the translations which should be done uh, in I Indian languages of Lessing's work in order to introduce Lessing uh, uh, to our uh, local uh, and vernacular readers also. And uh, like uh, the idea of uh, introducing uh, Lessing across the disciplines, that was again, I mean, a very interesting idea if uh, it can be uh, furthered. Uh, so um, that is what uh, is my uh, observation and um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Already handed over the chart mm -hmm. so uh, please conduct the question. Okay, uh, so thank you so much, Chandrava uh, Chakravarti. Um, um, before beginning the business session to which I am assigned. Uh, to chair this evening, I would like to applaud the speakers of the previous uh, session for already setting up the tempo of the webinar with the right favor and uh, scholarship. Um, and with this, um, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Dinesh Kumar uh, to present his paper titled si South Asian Feminist Concerns in Taslima Nasreen's Fiction a comparative study with Doris Lessing. Uh, and also, I would like to uh, uh, tell you something about uh, uh, Professor Dinesh Kumar. Uh, Professor Dinesh Kumar has put in 15 years of service as Assistant Professor of English uh, at Dayal Singh College, Karnal. He has more than 40 research papers to his credit in various national and international journals. His thrust areas comprise of feminism, Dalit literature, comparative literature, Commonwealth literature, and post-modernism. Uh, besides, he has also contributed book chapters and delivered lectures in various colleges along with uh, talks in various national as well as international uh, conferences. 
he has also published two books george orwell's social vision a critical study uh, and the second book is voices in literature so uh, uh, he is also on board uh, uh, of various national and international uh, journals as a reviewer and as an editor so uh, mm, uh, professor dinesh kumar um, i call upon you to please uh, come and present your uh, paper thank you thank you ma'am uh, am i audible ma'am yes you are audible okay okay thank you ma'am and uh, concerning the feminist concern in tasleema nasreen fiction by comparing it to doris lessing's uh, feministic ideas we can find that there is no doubt and denying the fact that bangladeshi literature is the most fertile area of literary research it also forms the part of the commonwealth literature as well and uh, among the south asian female authors the name of uh, tasleema nasreen is very prominent and significant in her most celebrated and the and important work lajja shodh fera and french lover she has poured every inch and corner of her experiences we also examine her experiences through a new lens or by drawing a comparison of her works with other female authors particularly to uh, doris lessing in this paper <clears throat> in her phenomenal work lajja she has portrayed the concept of feminism through a new angle this work is a landmark achievement in uh, bengali literature in bangladesh and uh, this work is a powerful castigation of the uh, periodic uh, atrocities against the hindus and the writer has graphically delineated the idea of uh, national shame in this work and uh, if we go through we can say in brief in one of her novels shodh she deals with the motif of protest against the patriarchal colonial and upper class ideology of muslim muslim community from the female's point of view her work fera has also been translated into bengali first it was written in bengali and then it was translated into english which is based on the idea of bangladesh partition female identity family and politics by the author and quite contrary to fera Nasreen's work French Lover gives the reader a peep into the new culture. The Slima Nasreen's works have been a close resemblance with the Doris Lessing's work in which she like Nasreen delineates the idea of a free woman and Doris Lessing is one of the most important and prominent female writers of the modern period and particularly if we go through her novel The Golden Notebook which leaves her more enlightened and more aware of women's position in post world war second british milieu the form of the novel shows the post modern impact so that the chaos and the form are interextricably bound to one another in a and dialectical process and there is a, a subterranean undercurrent of the free women in the first person narrative in this work besides the aspect of free women lessing's work also throw light on the view point of sexuality the author also delineates beautifully how the free women are inhibited and even uh, outspoken in discussing the psychology of sex and uh, <clears throat> an uncompromising feminist if we say uh, describe the slima nasreen's writings so we find her writing as sarcastic comment on the redundant patriarchal values which mercilessly stifle the rights of the women by marginalizing and pushing them to the periphery of existence and uh, coming to you can say her novel lajja uh, which is a moving story of protest passion and uh, prosecution it is also the story of uh, humanity struggled as to assert the innate and the inherent rights in a society torn by forces of religious fundamentalism and blind fanaticism the slima nasreen raises her voice against uh, the and uh, draconian rulers of uh, bangladesh who are ideologically allied with the pakistan entertaining the hindus in their country as a slave race under the islamic uh, fundamentalism the muslim the mullahs of bangladesh have been meeting out all sort of physical and mental torture to the hindus nasreen feels that uh, shosho 
political identity would be destroyed if religious fundamentalism is allowed to have its full sway over the innocent Hindus. Written on the tomorrow of the demolition of Babri Masjid, Lajja depicts the forces of humanism and secularism which are equally on trial in a soil where people are uh, uh, balkanized uh, at the land of their birth and hard, uh, I can say, uh, eternness lived by the people of Bangladesh in this chapter. So, uh, we have uh, in her novel, uh, uh, with reference to, you can say, uh, her characterization, uh, so we find that there is a, a dramatic change in the same, you can say, the personality of the characters is somewhat uh, and does behavior changes from time to time throughout the plot, which may be counted for a, a you can say, show, some social situation. However, the character do not do justice to the chaos. The feminists show that the leading male character in the story or uh, who are, you can say, uh, who, are, who have been projected as selfish, uh, projecting the two female characters has very good souls and they made hardly any contribution to the family and it expected, it is, and uh, it is, you can say, expected that is allowed from the, uh, dam is the, the control ordered by the doctor later on effective where this, uh, uh, you can say, uh, all the you can say, female characters in this novel reflect this uh, cultural assumption which denies all chances of uh, uh, subjecthood for women. No women in the novel revolts against uh, this uh, assumption though at many places they can do so. All women, old or young, married or unmarried, need to be protected from being conquered. And uh, <coughs> we find uh, you can say, the character of uh, Kiron Moyes whose case is a very good example in this regard, whose husband uh, Sudhamo is rendered and sexually crippled during the war of independence that he fought for Bangladesh, but still he finds it uh, necessary to protect her chastity. The Slima Nasrin like, like Doris, uh, Doris Lessing brilliantly explores the agony and pain of being women when hatred spread over the virus of communalism rears its ugly head. But in case of uh, Doris Lessing, we don't find, you can say, this uh, uh, aspect of communalism. Rather, the Slima Nasrin, she has depicted through this uh, concept, the position of the women in the society. And it is the women who suffers the most and who more often than not, you can say, are the victim to gruesome act of cruelty in the name of religion and God. She is assaulted by she is assaulted not by physically but also emotionally and her very motherhood become the target of the mob, target, to, the target for the mob. They would molest her and in the name of being in the self-proclaimed uh, votaries of religion, they would force themselves upon her so that the next generation is born to their religion. The story of the, the Hindu girl in this novel talks about, you can say, this uh, this kind of, we can say, hatred. The novel explores the uh, terminal and torment of uh, protagonist uh, Suranjan progressive left stand in the nationalistic and crumbling of all his, his ideals uh, uh, surround him in, uh, where, sorry, the movement for women liberation began in 17th century, though it attained some success in the West. Women continue to be uh, persecuted in the developing world. We have to demolish the existing state's uh, structure and break the change of religion in order to liberate women. The Slima Nasreen craves women to educate themselves set on their own feet, have their own financial being, well-being and uh, fight for equality. So Nasreen portrays the motive of the protest against the patriarchal, colonial and upper class ideology of Muslim community from the female perspective. She revolts against fundamental Islamic values where women are subjected 
to violence and atrocities in a male dominated society the women being the victim of various circumstances are deprived of their status and freedom in their life so this is what uh, nasreen highlights in the present uh, you can say novel shod in shod unlike her you can say other novels the srima nasreen seeks to revolutionize the concept of love and marriage in the so called elite yet tradition bound societies she affects this uh, through the transformation of roles assigned to women as lover wife mother and daughter in law uh, in the present work jhumur the well educated bangladeshi girl marries her boyfriend harun harun lives with his parents and when they marry uh, jhumur is expected to live with him like any other bangladeshi women but life with her in laws is very you can say difficult for you can say her and she is not allowed to go anywhere and she is and you can say the daughter in law of the house because these are the this is the foundation for her and in this situation she is expected to do the entire cooking cleaning etc in other words she is her mother in law you can say handmaid and her independent bent of mind does not allow her to take kindly to this kind of uh, uh, treatment and uh, in short taslima nasreen's resistance to patriarchal marriage rights is you can say brought into focus shod is a story of compulsory transformation of a girl into a wife and uh, her hungry revenge the story explores the institution of marriage uh, its regulatory structure of uh, surveillance and uh, subordination in this story taslima provides a critical examination of the initiation rights of marriage of the effacement of female subject through those rights jhumur the central character in this novel subverts through the patriarchal agenda of effacement of female by conceiving a child outside her marriage and passing off as her husband's harun in legitimate son through her covert strategy jhumur tries to undo the bangladeshi patriarchal society by planting deceit at its heart in its narration the story of jhumur's subordination in harun's family becomes representative of system rather than uh, also you can say isolated isolated incident by foregrounding the mechanism of patriarchal supremacy in the family the cinema nasreen brings to scrutiny area of subjugated knowledge describing the reaction to the new feminist movement moren lockwood carden writes i quote the press and other you can say mass media had field day making for the women you can say libers unquote the reaction they reported were often highly charged emotionally negative and frequently contradictory these women were sexually uh, promiscuous uh, deprived and uh, the hated men wanted to take over the world or wanted to subordinate men to women they were portrayed variously as ejecting both marriage and motherhood they were unhappy married or divorced or single physically unattractive they were uh, compensating their any their failure as women stringent hostile hysterical and mal adjusted they lacked human compassion and perspective in this way by removing the wheels of affection and the martial relationship taslima nasreen engages in foregrounding the polit- politics of that relationship and that institutions the dubious status of uh, affection in this story underscores the power relations that underlies the bangladeshi ideology of marriage in taslima stories marriage itself is divided of romanticism utilized to seduce the imagination of bengali women and the focus on the structure of the domination and exploitation in the marriage destroy the affection that mystifies marriage for bengali men and women so that is what also we we find in the novels of and uh, um, uh, the doris lessing also who is dealing with the idea of uh, new women in her uh, fictional works and in a pat- patriarchal or patrilocal or patrilineal marriage the novel showed 
द सर्विलेंस ऑफ झूमर चेस्टिटी इज क्रूशली इंपॉर्टेंट टू हेरून इन ऑर्डर टू एंश्योर प्रॉपर डिसेंट आफ्टर वन एंड हाफ मंथ ऑफ मैरिज वेन झूमर टर्न्स टू हेरून फॉर अफेक्शन एंड एंड अप्रूवल शी ही रिस्पॉन्ड्स विद डिसप्लेजर एंड डिस्ट्रस्ट इन एंड सेज दैट इट इज नॉट हिज चाइल्ड द नॉवल शोट डिपिक्स वेरियस एस्पेक्ट ऑफ ह्यूमन अग्नि and uh, also pathos in detail there is a team a group of uh, seven boys or two girls they play with tops marbles and uh, uh, games like cricket football and badminton on the ground of worry jhumar is the leader of the gang and no one could catch up with her not even the boys who are couple of years older so in this way uh, this novel shows the resistance of the females that throws light on the various hidden system working against women and the fight against her system and geography the most neglected women who has been subjugated to um, any you can say any maladies or revenge or you can say phone uh, we find that uh, um, the manner in which we can say she protest uh, in the novel uh, <laughs> and you can say text you can say revenge upon you can say around the indicate it indicates for her inner coordinate that melts into misery and torture uh, in the novel and uh, in this way we find how taslima uh, nasrin uh, she has depicted a uh, very you can say graphic picture as in his novel you can in her novel lajja where the author confirms the truth of his observation and she does not rely on her own can say perception and experience as a woman who is also a feminist rather she identifies herself with the masculine experiences and perspective and presents them as if they are universal so uh, it will not be wrong to say as far as the novel lajja is concerned that uh, she belongs to the category of a women writers who do someone else you can say men's writing and in their uh, innocence sustain it and give it voice and ends producing writing that is uh, you can say in effect you can say masculine so the women writers the uh, and the works written by the you can say female authors conform to the patriarchal ideology which were popularized and highlighted by using various methods such as public discussion criticism raising controversies the slima nasreen not only can say her novels but also you can say poetry where she takes a strong feminist position it is not popularized on the other hand the work that do not conform the patriarchal system are obscured and forgotten this situation is described as female you can say tokenism by andian rich one of the important uh, female writer and the analysis of the female character in the novel throws light on the fact that they are portrayed to suit the patriarchal society and there are five women characters in the that novel maya kiranmay shamima pravin kumar yes uh, yes sir interrupt you uh, but, but uh, your time is already up okay ma'am you... just 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 winding up just winding up so in this way tasleema nasrin she has projected uh, very beautifully the you can say miserable condition of the females and also deals with the idea of uh, new women as uh, we find in doris lessing works so uh, can say like you can say doris lessing the female character portrayed by uh, tasleema nasrin or can say mentally passive in the roids because she takes into consideration some political aspect also tasleema nasrin and uh, these we can say roids do not break you can say their passivity they merely suffer remain busy in routine life and never think about social religious and political problem of the day so that was all about uh, my paper ma'am so. uh, thank you so much professor uh, dinip uh, for this insightful paper uh, on comparison of the slima nasreen um with Doris Lessing um uh, the next speaker that we have in business session 2 is professor swati mitra and professor swati mitra is speaking on the subject 
reading the city vasti through the figure of the post colonial flanner in blessings the four gated city and in intezar husain's vasti uh, before we uh, begin the paper i would like to uh, present us a brief bio note of uh, professor mitra uh, swati mitra is an assistant professor in english uh, um, working under west bengal education service currently posted in another college kolkata she has been teaching for more than 25 years she is also member of the doris lessing society and ias kla ls She explored Doris Lessing's novels, both her MPhil and PhD dissertations. Uh, has been particularly drawn to Lessing's uh, use of multivalent uh, narrative texts and forms. She presented papers in many national and international conferences, including Doris Lessing's second trial Leeds in 2007. as a charles wallace scholar and again presented a paper in doris lessing centenary conference held in the university of east anglia norwich uk in 2019 uh, she initiated a writing workshop in british council kolkata to commemorate lessing centenary in 2019 and in the same year presented a proposal to the doris lessing society to begin the chapter in south asia so it is uh, swati mitra's efforts uh, she initiated this um, south asian chapter of doris lessing international doris lessing society uh, so here we are <laughs> so uh, now i invite upon uh, professor uh, swati mitra to please um come and present uh, her paper yes uh, swati please thanks sachel i hope i am audible yeah you are thank you okay the the title of my paper is a somewhat convoluted but it is reading the city stroke basti through the figure of the post colonial flanor in both lessings the four gated city uh, published 1969 and in intezar husain's basti 1979 uh, industrialization and colonialism together made the modern city the epicenter of life the drift towards the city that began with industrialization continued in the colonies as the colonial rulers built cities and packed them with people from all over the land in different profit making work engendering a need to reach the city the foremost goal of every colonial subject white or colored my two chosen texts reveal the same pattern uh, <clears throat> that is the forgotten city which is um, the fifth book of lessing's children of violence uh, um, um, it is an autobiographical bildungsroman and uh, intezar husain's basti they are both buildings roman in form and they have strong autobiographical uh, overtones as i mentioned and lessing's narrative traces the passage of a white british girl martha quest who grows up in the wells of southern rhodesia now zimbabwe makes her way to the nearest city salisbury now harare shoots briefly to johannesburg and then finally goes to london in the zarwisens Urdu novel Basti traces the passage of a Muslim boy Zakir Hussain growing up in Rupnagar in the United Provinces which is current day UP of pre-independent India that is shifting to Bilaspur again in UP briefly to Meerut and finally moves to Lahore although the city Lahore is left unnamed throughout the novel uh, for my paper i have taken them into three different blocks calling them the colonials that is zakir and martha are the colonials then they become uh, the they investigate or they explore the city so we talk about the city and then we see them as the flanors that they become of the city the post colonial flanors 
So Martha's colonial is a second generation, and as Ratna had pointed out, a very reluctant col uh, colonial like Lessing herself, resistant to the discourses of colonialism, racism, and gender inequalities. She is bred on the literature of England and Europe, had uh, socialist ideas, and was a member of the Communist Party for a short while, while in, uh, in Rhodesia. Martha is dismayed and stultified in the colonial culture and wishes to break free. Her colonial life and frust uh, frustrations with it are explored in the first four books of the series, Children of Violence. The narrative timeline is the interval years, that is, of the first four books, that is. And it, in the final book, which is The Four Gated City, Martha has reached England and experiences London. The, no, the entire series and the final book ends with her death reported uh, in some oblique letter in the end. Even though the war in Europe dominates life in the colonies, with people from RAF camping in Salisbury and contributing to the colorful social life, there is very little mention of the African protests, for instance, the, uh, the gradual buildup uh, of revolt, the Chimurenga, the second Chimurenga took place in the 1960s. But there's very little pro uh, mention of that in The Children of Violence. Of course, in elsewhere in Lessing, the African question does make um, a, a, a more stronger impact. In Ripple from, from the Storm, which is the third book of The Children of Violence, Martha, as a member of the Communist Party, engages with Africans, educating them in the world politics and extending healthcare facilities. She is sympathetic, sympathetic towards the condition, is critical of racism, but she's not, that is, her narrative is not invested in the African question or the African situation. Her quest is for the ideal city the one that she had envisioned upon the, upon the world, a utopian place inclusive of all, including the undernourished, fat-bellied African boy. I would ask you to note the, the typification of the African child here. Um, Martha is, for people like the African critics of Doris Lessing, um, like Anthony Channels, who are, a liberal thinker who subverted the white settler discourse but did not contribute to the formation of the African nation state. Hussein's protagonist, Zakir, is an upper class progressive Muslim educated in the University of Mirat and exposed to Western and Persian literatures. Unlike Martha, he is not a rebel but an obedient son of a pat patrician Malvi. He is a quiet person and affected and uninvested in the history-making events of pre-independent India. He is happy to read all the poetry, be in love with his cousin Sabra, and spend time with his friend Surinder. The first chapter that narrates this idyllic life of Zakir is reads like a genesis because it begins like this: when the world was all new, when the sky was fresh, and the earth not yet soiled. However, the idyll is disturbed intermittently by noises from political rallies and meetings. The chapter ends with serious trouble brewing and Zakir and Surinder separating at symbolically a fork road leading severally to the Hindu and Muslim neighborhoods of the small town of Biaspur. In the second chapter, Zakir and his parents are already in Pakistan. The passage to Pakistan, however, is elided over by Hussein, as is the violence during the, that marked the partition, as well as the Hussein family's decision to rule Ekwit. But the narrative run, returns to these elisions time and again through memories, exchanges, and regrets. Also, with trouble continuing in their present in, in the relocated Basti, um, and with no mention of nations or cities, the narrative creates a strange sense of continuity between the Indian Basti and the Pakistani Basti. And it contradicts the very idea of the new nation that was pursued with so much, and may I say new nations, that was pursued with so much zeal prior to the independence. 
So we come to the basti or the city to which the colonial won the uh, one the white colonial subject of a decolonized empire and the next the colored colonial subject of a of an kind of carved out uh, nation state that is being formed um, that was formed by the division of uh, of the original um, country uh, the two cities in which they relocate Martha and Zakir they are both colonials who relocate pursuing the ideal city. Uh, London for Martha and Pakistan, literally the pure land for Zakir. But they are both to be disillusioned. The four-gated city begins with Martha sitting in front of a grind glass um, and looking at an even more grimy London. As John McLeod observes in, in post-colonial London, rewriting the Metropolis 24, it is one of the what Martha feels the dismay, the horror, the anger, the disillusionment is one of the th is is the kind that most of the thousands of people who came to London from the colonies, white or colored, um, and they were made to engage with the war and ravaged London of the fifties, had to uh, experience because. The colonial idea of London is engendered by the reading of English literature. McLeod notes that their early experiences of London are one filled with total dismay and disbelief. Doris Lessing catches this mood also in Pursuit of the English, published in 1960. Uh, but she also does the same in the second volume of her uh, of her. Um, autobiography, Walk in the Shade, and as well as in the final volume of Children of Violence, which is The Forgetted City. I'm choosing to focus on The Forgetted City primarily because it allows a culmination of the city motive that Lessing uses through the series. London, uh, Martha realizes one who, uh, the same Martha who had envisioned the forgetted city on, on the on the veil, um, realizes that London is a myth-bred city the city of our parents, of childhood stories about, about home, and a city created by the great English writers that the colonials, both white and colored, internalized. London for them is, was the seat of culture, so was it for Martha. However, when Martha arrives in London, it appears to be ugly, completely lacking in any sense of art and grace in all things that were displayed as covetable in the shops of the famous Oxford Street. She laughed and grinned simultaneously at her childish myth-bred notions about London. And Martha spent her initial days at the wharves, the margins of the city, avoiding to cross over to the real city that was cold, judgmental, and procrastinian. She who has come from the margins of the empire waited, poised at the margins of the city, the epicenter of the empire, to understand its real nature before becoming a part of it. Lessing portrays this tension through a vignette of involving Martha and her upper class shaper and Henry, um, who may meet at Baxter, a seat of London upper class culture. When Henry hears about Martha living by the river with the working class, he considers it to be slumming. To Henry, London is a jolly little place. Martha refuses to conform to such appearances. Her walks through the city and random bus rides across it had made her witness to its horrible entrails, as it were. As she struggled with, its, with the city's ugliness, squalor, and biases, she overheard people discussing the situation in London and generally about the whole of England in the pubs. And it made Martha think that the entire nation was immersed in some kind of a delusion, thinking about communism, liberalism, when the city, which was the center, was horribly divided by class discriminations. Martha, living with the working class of London, acquires an idea of the city, free from such delusory liberal ideas. Later, she, as a secretary to a writer, Mark Coleridge, goes on to live in an upper-class family in Radditt Street in the famous Bloomsbury area. 
the house on Radit Street, where most of the events subsequently unfold, becomes quite literally the epicenter of the narrative and of Martha's own position. Martha's journey from Rhodesia to London, or from Stella, the gypsy woman's home at the Lon London Wharfs, to the Bloomsbury household, is a journey from the margin to the center. Zaki's response to Pakistan is much muted. He, re he recalls his initial eagerness to explore the new place. For him, it was like walking on a new earth. However, the experience was intermingled with his homesickness. That is, uh, he missed his old room in Vyaspur, the trees of Rupnagar and Vyaspur. Missed the veld and the skies, the sun and the sound of Africa. Unlike Martha, who hides herself in an oversized coat as she angrily walked the grey wet streets of London, Zakir feels exhilarated by his first immersive work through the Anarkali Bazaar and the Mall Road, with its colourful confusion of horse carts, cars, buses and scooters. He was also impressed by the big built men around him that clearly differentiated him from the indigenous people of the city. If Martha was distinct, uh, makes a distinction between uh, is distinguished by her uh, by her um, accent, then Zaki would normally be uh, clearly distinguished from the people surround from the indigenous people who were basically tall, well built Punjabi uh, men. And um, as he walked through the bazaar, he he noted how old acquaintances would bump into each other and whenever they did that they would talk and they would talk about the uh, about those who and i'm quoting here those who had set out with them but had been separated on the road and about those whom they left on unknown roads unshrouded and unburied then they would dry their eyes and begin to think about a future here the deictic words here, there, encourage a contrapuntal reading of the situation. So do the words east and west in the context of Pakistan. Flanor and my use of flanor in this text. Now, the, uh, what Walter Benjamin would have us believe in his, um, in his Arkad's um, project is that the use of flanor died down with modernism. Modernism saw almost a relic of the old Baudelairean flanor. And uh, he points out that the departmental store really killed the arcades and the entire business of the lazy, uh, uh, detached, a little uh, and privileged flanor walking and noting life almost as if it was a miniature painting. Now, Zaki's experience of Lahore and Pakistan is both his own as well as shared among the millions who left India and relocated to Pakistan. However, Zakir is the worker of the streets, and his name in Arabic means one who remembers. Zakir is a quiet con chronicler of the nascent nation state of Pakistan. The tortuous narrative of Hussein interweaves the multiple realities of Zaki's life, the lived reality in India and Pakistan, and the recalled and or imagined realities of both the Bastis. The narrative is simultaneously interspersed by the discourses of religion, sectarianism, communism, nationalism, and progressive liberalism. Zaki is a perfect planar, the privileged insider-outsider and with his natural reticence, he becomes a quiet watcher and the noter of events and people. The Anarkali Bazaar, the Mall Road, Shiraz, and the Imperial Hotel, uh, which was the seat of an old, which was an old colonial establishment, are to him what the arcades of Paris were to the French Flanors. His ruminative view allows a graceful comment rather than a rancid attack on the times as he notes the violence in the city or in the college, the attack on Shiraz and the destruction of the imperial, a seat, um, Zakir is also filled and reflects a sense of loss. It is the loss of an old world, the world he had come to, the one he had made his own in Pakistan. 
The sense of loss that overwhelms Zakir is a reflection also of a collective sense of loss, a continuation of a loss which the partition of, in, of the erstwhile India, that is uh, pre-independent India, and the subsequent dislocation of the people had become latent and integral to the subcontinent ever since. It is all, it, it, uh, this sense of loss, as uh, we South Asians might notice, is triggered by any change brought to old cultural registers, be it an edifice, a practice, or even a song. Zakir is, a, is also a post-colonial Flanor, whose post-coloniality makes him adopt a contrapental view to his historical condition and the city that he's that he roams. The post-colonial Flanor does not offer a totalitarian view like the Parisian Flanor. His hybridity makes his engagements contrapuntal, as um, Said would point out. Thus, when Zaki sees Crush India written on the walls of Lahore, uh, he is left disconcerted. He cannot decide when his friends ask him whether he is for the war or against it. His relationship with India is a complex one. And I, I think so is every other person who had relocated to Pakistan after partition. It, um, because it necessarily involves their relationship with the old colonial India and that with the new independent emergent one. For Zaki, the war with India triggers his memories of his cousin Sabra, who was still in India. For Zaki's mother, uh, uh, India is what she associates with the trees and the birds and with the Haveli at Rupnagar and the family heirlooms that she thinks about when the war begins, uh, which she leaves, uh, which she had left behind locked in the storeroom and she goes hunting for the keys. For Zaki's father, India housed their family grave in Rupnagar, left untended and inaccessible to the family. Something in the, which partition cannot uh, resolve for, especially for the Muslims living in India, and especially for the Shia Muslim for whom the grave is always the most important place. Zakir walked through the streets of Lahore and through the labyrinths of his memories. His memories ran contrary to his historical situatedness. The innocence of his days in Rupnagar, Vyaspur, is the innocence that marked the birth of the new nations and the violence and ideological uh, the, and the violence both ideological and physical which marks the two basties leads to the loss of the innocence. Martha is also a post-colonial flanor and her sharp reproof of the English England London is a post is a post-colonial rejection of the colonial capital. However, London is also the home to which she has returned to after leaving one home. Because in the settlers' discourse, London was home. Uh, that, um, when Lessing entitles her account of a visit to Africa in 1956 as going home, she, subsequent, she subverts this settlers' discourse. On the, on the other hand, Martha walks through London's uh, walks through London reveals the unhomely to her, and as one may also call it, the unhemlich, the uncanny. She notes now the place where the bomb had fallen. That was how they spoke of it: the bomb, their bomb, out of the thousands that had fallen on London. About three acres lay flat, bar, bar, bed of building. Almost it was a half job. The place had neither been cleared nor left. It was as if some great thumb had come down and rubbed out buildings carelessly, and then the owner of the thumb had blown away bits of debris and rubble, but carelessly. All the loose rubble had gone, etc. Then there was a uh, there was a crossbones and skull, danger, no children behind the ruin of the house. And then Behind the house, a group of children squatted, spinning marbles of their thumb across yellow earth. The callous indifference of the civic authorities contrasts sharply with Martha's vision of the orderly, inclusive, ideal city. In the end of the narrative, 
Martha refuses to participate in the building of any ideal city. And she begins to consider the notion of the ideal city as a construct of the imperial industrial West. The garden and the gardener is what she chooses as she's buffeted by counter discourses. Martha finds herself split in her effort to engage with all the discourses that, that divide her. The different personas of Martha that pop in and out of the final book and its narrative show the divisions within Martha. Interestingly, one may regard Zakir and his friends and at times his co-workers in Lahore Irfan, the critic, and Abzal, the lover of birds and trees, as a narrative ploy to show the split in Zakir. Both Martha and Zakir internalize their walks through the cities as they continue to traverse in the different zones of their mind. Martha through her experiences and Zakir through his memories. As Lessing and Hussein's protagonists struggle with the divergent discourses of their existence, the city for the post-colonial uh, flanor becomes phantasmagoric as they fail to make se any sense of the divisions within them. The middle-aged Martha tries to reconnect with the city and experience the moments of calm that she had experienced, uh, that she had felt when she had first reached London. However, once she is once out, she had a horrifying vision of humankind that sent her fleeing down Oxford Street. Zak um, I'll just take two to three more minutes. Zakir mm -hmm. walks through the streets and has visions like Zakir also walks through the streets in a state and experiences a phantasmagoric vision, which he which he explains like the visions of Abul Hassan of the Thousand and One Nights. I looked at a head, I found it gone. Both Lessing and Hussein end their narratives on a cataclysm. London is destroyed and Lahore is taken over by violence. In the post-colonial Flanor open city and the urban palaces, Alexander Greer Hartwiger notes the significance of the emergence of the Flanor in post-colonial times. Unlike Benjamin uh, Hartwiger points out how the Flanor returns and the changed nature of the post-colonial Flanor, whose view is not totalizing as that of the French Flanors, but ref uh, which reflect an imperialist view. The point of view of the post-colonial Flanor is more critical. The post-colonial narrative too attempts a re rewording, replacing the ep imperial epicenter with the global city. However, the narratives of the text that I have chosen do neither. That is, they neither replace nor reworlds. The struggle for the post-colonial Martha and Zakir are not a dialectical one between white and black, then and us, here and there, east, west, colony, colony and center. It is within, once the path from the margin to the center has been made, the war between uh, it all becomes futile. The war between east and west Pakistan proved this futility, as did Martha's experiments with her different personas in which she tries to find her true self. Lessing offers Martha a re the, 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 the kind of relief that Sufism can bring. And Martha sails away to the Faris Island, which is on the fringes of civilization. So once again, a journey now from the center to the margins to find one's resolution. Zakir, on the other hand, walks through the burning city and reaches the symmetry in which he had uh, buried his father who could not return because of the boundaries that divide nations um, and be buried in his own home in, his, uh, in Rupnagar. So Zakir, in the end of the novel, sits with Afzal and Irfan on the fringes of the city on the, uh, at the symmetry. And that is how both Lessing and Hussein concludes their narratives, um, Lessing with her idea of Sufism, Hussein, who uses the syncretic Islamic uh, ideas, build uh, intermixing it with Islamic history, myth, Buddhist history, and Hindu history to offer Zakir 
the one who remembers the experience of the city which becomes his basti. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, Swati, you are uh, you are muted, probably. Oh no, yes. I think I'm. Uh, I kind of am muted. Yes. Again, again, the voice is on. Yeah, I'm here, but I couldn't hear you. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Thank you so much, Swati. That was a wonderful paper. Uh, and both the papers uh, that we had, uh, um, Professor Dinesh Kumar's paper and Professor uh, Swati Mitra's paper are open for discussion. Uh, you can post your questions, your queries, your comments in the chat box, or else you can um, directly uh, speak as well. Hello? Uh, yes. yes. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah. This is Dr. Um, I'm very talking, I, I guess. Or is, is it? Uh, no, no, there are two mics which are. Is it Dr. Ratna Raman talking? No, no, I'm silent. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, Swapna Roy uh, wants to, I guess, uh, say something. Yeah. Yeah, I want to ask a question uh, to Dr. Shwati Mitra. Uh, can I ask that? Yeah, yeah, sure, please. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I was uh, listening to your talk and it is uh, beautiful, beautiful. But uh, your uh, paper presentation actually uh, uh, keeps me reminding a lot of things. Uh, before I ask a question, I want to um, read out something. Uh, that is, uh, don't we belong to the places? Places that live within us, haunt us, and sometimes fade within us. Where is our home? What makes our home a home? Which is our home? And why it is a home? Is it only for longing for peace and solitude? So you are talking about home, you are talking about partition, and a lot of things. It's for me that while a being uh, tries to uh, set his or her boundaries uh, in a new way and breaks the old territories and uh, re-territorializes his or her new territories and creates a new space. And that space one day is going to uh, quote unquote shatter or uh, uh, going to be broadening up. So it's more about uh, a journey from uh, margin to center or it can be uh, centered to somewhere else and this this particular thing has a uh, many things uh, in our memory so what's your uh, point or what do you want to add while we are talking about uh, memory uh, the home the space and uh, it's all about the territory so my question is to that Well, frankly, I have no idea about either home or territory, but seems like Lessing and Hussein had because they had relocated. But yes, um, I think uh, um, engaging with what you're saying, um, it's not what I normally would uh, respond to, but um, I think this is um, <coughs> the idea of home and... Um, and how one bears with it. Uh, what Lessing and Hussein were trying to say is what you're saying, that uh, that they are very problematic ideas, um, in especially in a world which is, uh, which is uh, a complex and made complex by, thing, uh, by the industrial uh, se settlement of people, by the colonial relocation of people. So, uh, uh, of course, that is a very, very historical um, and uh, epoch-making um, situation, as one would say. 
uh, as so is the partition which uh, forced people to leave their homes and find their homes elsewhere uh, but uh, i think uh, uh, although ratna did did mention that this is not going to be about uh, a woman's platform i uh, wouldn't like to make it one but uh, the picture uh, the the way the one still functions within patriarchy i think marriage and leaving home uh, becomes a given for most women uh, in south asia at least so can i fully uh, interrupt swati i didn't yes, say yes. not a woman's platform i said not not just people. Yeah, yeah, not just churches. Yeah. So I, I really didn't want to bring this in, but I think this uh, we can look into a bit of an. Uh, I mean, life writing is not what I was looking at, but if we take these ideas, uh, and then uh, we are many women living or uh, here, and this is something which is um, not unknown to anyone who is part of the audience today. I think relocating. Uh, uh, almost being culturally uh, convinced to relocate after marriage uh, the dinesh kumar uh, had a lot of talk about marriages i think so did umesh's paper talking about you know marriage and the woman trying to move away from the home that one knew in lessing and anita desai also the woman trying to make a home uh, forced to make a home almost because it's a gendered idea that what that is what one would be doing um, so i think no, uh, can i just ask you a question in return swati which is that uh, yes there are relocations but these are both horizontal and vertical and geographical yes i think increasingly in the modern world that they are in uh, atomic universes symbolized by or crystallized by or reconstructed by the nuclear family uh, this is happening to both men and women and i know i'm sounding like an apology for the feminist which i'm not i mean i realize how terribly women's rights and spaces are not only trampled upon as a matter of fact people don't think they exist so we still when we are giving academic presentations we are talking about what the modern woman is we are talking about a lack of beauty or a lack of femininity which makes uh, makes these new women you know uh, ready to dissolve and destroy family structures but i just think that what lessing says all the time and you know she has been attacked not for what radha says are conservative positions in feminism it's the more radical feminists who come and attack her and say things like every man will be wearing this is jeanette winterson And I remember feeling so. Oh, I know, I know, know her. Yes. You know, every man will be wearing these boxer shorts, saying, "I love Doris," because she said, "You know, let's stop bashing men." I I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so, I remember that. But uh, um, I think given that um, she was uh, she of course talks in a completely different culture. Uh, but I um, honestly um, I would also uh, agree with that. even within um even within the indian uh, structure uh, or a south asian structure uh, i think uh, this is something i often say in my feminism or gender classes that um, well you know uh, boys can cry and uh, that is uh, the uh, well, let's begin with that boys can cry boys can talk boys can emote perhaps if all that happens the violence can go down a little whether whether domestic or even out in the world um so i think if um, even that can be encouraged uh, i think the maybe a change can take place um and what we are thinking we could also at this point dig deep into what are our cultural icons you know we don't have the virgin mary who's been sort of talked to death metaphorically uh, we have shakti we have kali we have tara we have uh, gaia we have the earth mother uh, we have annapurna the giver of food 
So if you look at these uh, iconic female symbols, I mean, it's very important for us to reclaim these also. And that is also going to be part of our own uh, restatement of the female principle or the feminist principle or whatever you want to call it. So I keep thinking that at the end of uh, Memoirs of a Survivor, you have this goddess, remember? Yes, the one the one who is not mentioned. Out, yes. you know? So I kept looking at this woman and saying, okay, so where does she come from? You know, Because it's not there in the mainstream traditions at all that the West has chosen to valorize. So I always keep thinking that maybe, you know, maybe just maybe these this particular symbol comes from another part of the planet. Okay, having said this, I shall now withdraw because, yeah, and give you the floor. I, I think we were having a perfect conversation. Uh, it's just that um, uh, one thing I would like, I, I don't mind the Kali and the Durga uh, and the part of India I come from. Uh, it is... Um, uh, we had five days of Kali Puja just yes, which ended yesterday. So mm. I'm all for that. It's just that I uh, also have reached um, perhaps that phase of belief. Maybe it will change in a year or so or 10. Uh, but uh, I am not in favor of, um, you know, deification of women at any level no, no, no. because this has to be uh, not deification not worship not yeah. identity, it's, it's, not the, it's just, in the face of deities but i think they're powerful symbols yeah they're powerful they're symbols. Right only at a personal level yeah the moment the state takes over or the cult takes over then what we have is a lot of ritual rubbish you know so, so I'm, there, I'm not, I'm, uh, and a lot of appropriation within the, the, the within absolutely. the patriarchy so you know absolutely uh, I, mean, I, I completely second what you're saying so, second and third what you're saying <laughs> yeah so uh otherwise yes um the kali does rise in me so very often that yes. i do not mind the kali at all <laughs> i do mind the durga though i do mind the durga yeah. though you know yeah. i really feel it is a lot of law uh, yeah. and a lot of labor politics can go into it i don't like the idea of the ten-handed uh deity with only one head to look into uh all the ten yeah. hands you know i really find that to be to be a a, a very peculiar male construct although i we love durga puja but it is um, doing the woman idea in too badly uh, yeah. we are not supposed to be multitasking so much absolutely not anyway the truth is we are multitasking all the time yeah so, i wish we did not, we not have to. <laughs> we are multitasking all the time so yeah, yes in fact in yeah. fact in Indian yeah. mythology Men, men are multi thinking all the time. Like, I mean, having four no, no, heads. No, no, ten no, heads. No, no. Men don't think at all. And, and <laughs> women have, have pick up structures ten, and ten, <laughs> ten headed. Too much thinking. Ten yes, ten handed women and ten headed okay. men. That's right. Well, what? if you have ten hands, you do need at least five heads. Uh, why? I was. I, come on, if you have to coordinate with all the hands, don't are you need... Saying, no, are you saying that one brain can only work one pair of hands and legs? I uh, know, otherwise you would be multitasking. But if you need ten heads, I think you're in a very bad place. I think that's really yeah. what the symbolism is telling us. Yeah, I can... I, I was just mm, suggesting it in some way of, you know, uh, when you kind of build on your RAM for your computer, you do add to the RAM, no? Only bites, yeah. Not heads. That's that's the that. that. <laughs> that's the uh, head. But yeah. Yeah. But if there are questions, uh, yeah. Back to the. Uh, Swati, may I add here that yeah. I really like the comparison you made. I mean, the four gated city because I I see the four gated city as a reference to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, like, I mean, to uh, the um, Christian myth. And similarly here, I mean, in Pakistan, the as you uh, mentioned in your paper also, mentioned in your talk also, that Pakistan, the very, uh, the uh, nomenclature means that the pure uh, country. So, uh, like, and in, in both the cases, 
in both the cases, the myth gets broken. Uh, the myth is shattered. Uh, the very foundation of building up Pakistan uh, is laid on bloodshed and loss. And similarly, Martha Quest's uh, quest, again, <laughs> so uh, her quest ends at, uh, again, with a shattered myth of a four-gated city. And eventually, she also has to either uh, 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 leave the civilization and uh, there she can realize uh, this kind of a vision. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, as you said, that this is a phantasmagoric, uh, uh, I mean, it's just an idea which uh, uh, can never probably be realized. I don't know whether both the novels, they ended up as uh, uh, on a tragic note or maybe on a higher consciousness on a note of higher consciousness, that probably uh, uh, it is um, the uh, the myth, uh, like the utopian reality. Instead of the utopian reality building an alternative way, uh, world, which is perfect. Because as far as I understand, even Taoism and uh, Sufism as well, uh, that they do not uh, talk about perfect worlds or even perfect human beings. It is about living in this world and accepting, accepting the imperfections, accepting the imperfections of the world, but at the same time, constantly uh, working towards uh, a better future, a better, uh, yes, uh, a better world. Uh, but yes, a, 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 a pure world, a pure country, a pure nation, uh, where everybody is same, where everybody is pure, uh, probably is uh, not possible. And um, like, as you said, uh, that the protagonist in Basti uh, then uh, embraces the ideas, the alternative visions also, which is his heritage as well as anyone else's. So, I mean, uh, this uh, whole idea of purity and uh, the utopian reality. I mean, it, it gets busted so many times in uh, uh, fiction. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. you see, uh, what I found interesting is also this, that um, what, what Lessing is doing is, of course, she's not only subverting the discourses of colonialism and industrialism, but also Christianity, which she has always rejected and continues to reject. And uh, the same I can't say about Hussein, that she's, he's rejecting uh, um, Islam because he's not. But uh, what is interesting is that both do have a shared, um, the Judeo-Christian uh, source for themselves. And uh, the idea of the promised land, um, you know, which comes from the idea of imperialism and war, uh, two, uh, two tropes which Hussein and Lessing are constantly exploring. The idea of, you know, uh, imperialism and the idea of war. But, uh, but Hussein also has the idea of, um, uh, of the journey from Mecca to Medina uh, as a subtext uh, in, in, in his narrative which would mean also a spiritual rejuvenation, which is something what perhaps he had looked forward to when he, uh, or what is uh, what he wanted to express when he was talking about Zakir moving to Pakistan, which doesn't take place. So he returns in the end to a much more syncretic culture of India, uh, of Indian Islamism, uh, which draws, you know, which doesn't really, uh, which kind of includes within it the idea of Krishna. And Krishna is very much there because he's a person from the United Provinces. So uh, Krishna uh, does come in time and again within the narrative. And so does the Buddha, which returns, um, uh, which comes in the end where Buddha is explaining the crisis to him. So I think these are uh, this much more syncretic view of life, much more non-industrial, non-imperialist, non-colonial, 
um, going back in into a pre-industrial state of mind, not necessarily life. But I think it's the mind which Ratna wanted to point out that we have icons. Uh, I think they were. He, they are also suggesting in the same way that perhaps we have been overridden, dominated by the Western industrial imperialist discourse for far too long. And maybe it's time because it did not work out. From from an imperial epicenter, we will now go on to forming a global epicenter. That is all that man can create, but. Can it do more to itself than just create these centers which become, as Blake had pointed out, you know, uh, seats of corruption? So I think both of them are taking it, as you very rightly pointed out, to a spiritual level, which uh, Shamindu and uh, Umesh, not um, uh, but you know, they, what Umesh had pointed out the existential crisis, something which I have. Uh, I did not use the term Umesh, but I have been talking about the existential crisis of the two protagonists. And then Shonindu points out that the wealth is a solution, that the solution must perhaps come from Sufi, from uh, from anything that is from uh, from that is outside the discourses which have dominated the world. Uh, I don't think I would really like to speak in uh, for any particular discourse, but uh, but definitely a non-profiteering, non-industrial idea for mankind might be a much more spiritual idea might be a solution in these times. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Swati. In fact, that is what I do meant. Uh, that uh, I I didn't mean uh, on that. Uh, Intizar Hussain rejected Islam, but I, I just meant that, I mean, um, that Islam, which uh, is more, more open, in fact, I mean, uh, like uh, like uh, the books written by Harun Khalid, uh, like uh, <coughs> he wrote about the presence of the Shiva cult um, mm. still in the, uh, like, uh, uh, subtext of Pakistani culture. And then uh, the tradition of Guru Nanak in us. I mean, it, it's similarly in India as well. Uh, the Sufi tradition. Uh, this is how we borrow from each other, and uh, that is how a, a, a better view of the world is built. Anyways, there is so much to talk. There is there the, uh, <laughs> there are so many more questions, so many more queries. I'll very quickly uh, just make a comment on Professor Dinesh Kumar's paper also. Um, so this was that uh, uh, he had mentioned uh, free women of lessing uh, versus uh, the women from South Asian cultures. I, I uh, found a very interesting, in fact, uh, direction I got uh, for uh, further studies, like the comparison of free women of lessing, like, for example, Martha Quest and uh, like... Uh, uh, Yes, in the women in golden notebook, particularly. Anna Wolf. Um, yes, Anna Wolf and uh, Molly Jacobs. Molly, Molly Jacobs. Molly Jacobs. Yes. So I mean, the comparison of these women with the women who are bound in the joint family structure, and as you said, deification of women in uh, South Asian um, milieu. Um, motherhood is also seen as uh, a very elevated status. Uh, of a woman, a woman actually gets her uh, in the society uh, based on the children she bears. Uh, firstly, the children, and then particularly the male child. So, I mean, uh, these are the further directions in which uh, I, I found that we can move. Um, anyways, uh, uh, both uh, your papers were very good. I mean, uh, and uh, the whole session. This is the the, the success of. Uh, the first day of the webinar goes to all the contributors, wonderful papers, wonderful insights we had. And uh, again, the idea which Dr. Radha Chakrabarti uh, proposed uh, actually repeated uh, the idea of translating Lessing's text into uh, Indian, uh, sorry, uh, I mean, languages of this South Asian region. 
um, that is an uh, idea which we have to now uh, actualize in the coming uh, times. Uh, so yes, so uh, congratulations to everyone for the successful completion of the uh, first day. Um, and there is a comment by Dr. Sajish Wapala. Yes, and uh, he has appreciated both your papers. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, so with, with this, I guess we wind up uh, today's proceedings and uh, with a note of uh, thanks to everyone. Um, yes, thank you so much. And so goodbye and we Good meet tomorrow. With me tomorrow at 6.30. Okay, fine.